Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk on building homogeneous Kubernetes clusters on multiple clouds, in spite of it being sunny and uh, nice outside. Uh, myself, I'm Sabri. I work in the VMware Integrated OpenStack team, of course, at VMware. Uh, but before we jump right into the topic, let's answer some of the basic questions here. What is Kubernetes? I don't think it needs an introduction anymore, but if I really have to say, it's an orchestration platform to deploy your containerized uh, application workloads. So what makes a Kubernetes deployment, well, enterprise grade? Well, the answer is a bit subjective, but in our opinion, it needs to be highly available. Uh, basically, you build it with multiple master nodes, you put a load balancer on top of it, uh, you cluster the HCD data stores, you have scalable worker nodes, uh, it needs to be upgradable and few other things. Uh, last but not least, it needs to be battle tested and like combat ready, right? So now, where do you actually deploy an enterprise grade Kubernetes cluster? There are tons of options out there. You could go with a hosted solution like uh, Google Container Engine, or you could use uh, uh, tons of tools out there like uh, KubeSpray, Kiabs. Uh, to deploy it on public clouds or on private clouds, uh, or you could do bare metal as well. The focus for this talk is going to be public and private clouds, in other words, multi-clouds. But before we get to multi-clouds, it's important to understand why you would even deploy Kubernetes cluster on a single cloud provider, right? I know you would have heard this in many talks like, uh, so uh, about cloud providers and Kubernetes. So what exactly is the deal with cloud providers? Well, it turns out that Kubernetes clusters that are configured with cloud providers have some distinct advantages. Specifically, they could leverage the underlying IAS capabilities uh, to get load balancers and uh, uh, persistent storage volumes for your container workloads. Uh, and in order to facilitate this, Kubernetes defines a cloud provider interface, uh, which is completely implemented out of box for clouds like AWS and OpenStack. Uh, specifically, specifically to drill more into the uh, advantages of running Kubernetes on a cloud provider, uh, you might have applications uh, like front-ends and API gateways in your deployment, and they could request for an external load balancer, and Kubernetes can work with the underlying cloud to create a load balancer. If it's AWS, it could be ELB, or if it's OpenStack, it could talk to Neutron LBAS and create a load balancer and route the traffic to your corresponding nodes, which will then get routed to your specific services. Um, and similarly, if you have stateful applications as part of your uh, deployment, you, uh, they could basically request persistent storage. Uh, in the case of OpenStack, that would be Cinder volumes, and in AWS, it could be the EBS volumes. So the cluster admins, uh, these volumes are actually dynamically created, so the cluster admin does not need to pre-create these persistent volumes in the cluster. So we looked at like why are the advantages of deploying Kubernetes on a cloud provider, but why would you want to do multi-cloud, right? One thing is that multi-cloud is a trend, general trend these days uh, for application deployment. There are different factors to do this. Specifically, you could be looking at an angle from cost savings perspective, where you want to offload all your development performance, scale, and other kind of Kubernetes clusters on-prem and run your production and staging workloads on AWS. That's one way to look at it or you might be interested in some sort of cluster federation uh, where you want to sync resources across different clusters for maybe failover or disaster recovery kind of purposes. Or, and last, uh, even for scalability purposes, if you are like uh, meeting increasing demands, uh, then you want to have to leverage some capacity on the fly on some public cloud. There could be uh, tons of other reasons and please ping me if you, in your organization you have something different. So. Uh, back to the main topic, right? Why do you want these clusters to be homogenous? Uh, there are good reasons to sp uh, span your Kubernetes clusters to multiple clouds, but the reason for them to be homogenous are plenty. Let's take a look at some of them. So in our opinion, clusters that offer uniform capabilities and services for your container workloads uh, are best suited for multiple cloud deployments. For example, like the homogeneous clusters avoids divergence in your multiple resource uh, definitions for your applications. Basically, uh, say you have a resource, service de uh, 
definition that needs an external load balancer in one cluster and it doesn't uh, require one in another cluster. You basically come up with different service uh, resource definitions for your applications for different clusters. Basically, that's not how it was meant to be, right? So uh, for our, it could be something like you pre-create your persistent volumes on one cluster but you, you leverage the dynamic provisioning on another cluster. So homogeneous clusters avoid these divergence in your resource definitions. And uh, by, eliminating, uh, the, uh, uh, by eliminating the inconsistencies in your Kubernetes service configuration, uh, you avoid issues like it worked in my cluster. Like how many times people have said that things worked in my development cluster, but when you move on to production clusters, things don't work. It's because these clusters are like differently configured. Your development clusters might have certain RBAC rules, uh, rules which are pretty lax, but your production clusters may have RBAC policies which are like pretty restrictive. And a developer may not know how your production cluster is actually built, right? So building homogeneous clusters avoid, avoids all these pitfalls. And uh, for example, we had a real issue where uh, queue proxy was configured with uh, uh, in the IP tables proxy mode in one of the clusters and was using user space in another one and we just couldn't figure out why the traffic was getting routed differently because of an underlying bug. Uh, and in some cases, different RBAC policies cause issues uh, specifically when you are using like uh, what do you call uh, service accounts for one cluster? Like if your applications uh, request like uh, service accounts, then those might have uh, tricky RBAC policies to deal with. And at the end of the day, ease of cluster operations and maintenance, right? When you want to deal with, uh, when you are dealing with uniform set of uh, cluster deployments across clouds. So the basic uh, reason for the talk, how do you build a homogeneous cluster? Well, Based on our experiences, what we think is that the best way is to decouple your infrastructure creation from Kubernetes provisioning. Uh, what we mean is that uh, by infrastructure is that everything like your VMs, load balancers, network storage, and everything that uh, encompasses your Kubernetes control plane, you want to like pre-create them separately and install the software Kubernetes binaries later on. Uh, more uh, like once you bring up a consistent infrastructure on multiple clouds, uh, then it becomes pretty easy to use config management tools to actually lay out your Kubernetes services. Uh, you could use infra as code tools like Terraform to create the infrastructure since they provide nice abstractions across different clouds. And uh, you could also like add hooks to scale out and scale in your worker nodes uh, with, and be independent of your config management tool. And uh, the other thing to make, uh, to another thing to note here is that uh, it's best to stick with a single config management tool or uh, scripts that's more comfortable for your organization because if you use different tools to lay out different clusters, then you are looking at different configurations because each of these tools come up with different defaults and that may not play well with your, uh, uh, with your workloads. And make sure to configure the same add-ons, monitoring, and logging solutions. Uh, then it's like pretty consistent, and you could easily debug them. Uh, it gets, just gives you a better operation insight. And if you really want to take it to the next level, like we do uh, in our company, you could do a lot more with user management. What we do is that for the authentic authentication part of the clusters, we integrate with a common identity provider uh, like Keystone with the Active Directory. Uh, so that you could log into all these clusters with your uh, corporate identity, right? And we push RBAC policies to these cluster to grant or revoke access to new users, like when you're onboarding users. It's pretty easy to do all this from a single point of view. And uh, the other thing that we did was to do some sort of namespace management so that you could share a single Kubernetes cluster across with different teams. Uh, this means that there's less number of clusters to maintain in your organization and you better leverage the capacity. We have a whole session in the upcoming KubeCon in Austin uh, which talks about this specific feature about namespace and user management. Look out for that. And the beauty of Kubernetes is that all this could be done independent of which cloud your Kubernetes cluster is running on. So whatever I spoke about, the user management and namespace management, it doesn't really matter where your Kubernetes cluster is actually residing on. And finally, for the ease of operation, we built like a single pane of glass to view, uh, view manage, and monitor all the clusters. Um, and uh, if you need uh, for more information, uh, talk to us at the VMware booth in the marketplace. And uh, uh, you could also learn more about uh, 
uh, how we incorporated a lot of these concepts into our product, uh, VMware Integrated OpenStack with Kubernetes. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, that's all about uh, the topic, and it's a powerful combination to run your container workloads. Thank you.